Hi everyone, this, uh, this lecture focuses very specifically on the Michelle Alexander reading The New Jim Crow. By the time you finish reading, you should be, and also listening to this lecture, you should be able to answer the following two questions. One, why did Alexander argue that mass incarceration is similar to the Jim Crow laws? Keep it in mind that in our previous, one of our previous lectures, we talked about Jim Crow laws, which were the laws that were part of the pre-Civil Rights South that, that legally uh, mandated segregation. In other words, African Americans were disproportionately targeted and told that they had to sit at the back of the bus, that they had to attend separate schools, they weren't allowed to vote. These were all legal ways in which discrimination happened. The other question that you need to be able to answer is, um, according to Latino, why are African Americans and Latinos so overrepresented in our prisons and jails? This is a really key question to be able to answer because this is how she talks about the ways in which race matters. In other words, she makes sure to help us understand that the reason why this is racism is that there are particular groups who are targeted. I think it's important to first start with a baseline definition of what mass incarceration system, what mass incarceration is. Mass incarceration is not just about jails. It's in fact the entire criminal justice system. So it refers not only to the criminal justice system, but also the larger web of laws, rules, policies, and customs that control those labeled as criminals both in and out of prison. This is very different from just thinking about a criminal who inhabits uh, or who's in jail, but this talks about things that are policies, procedures, processes that are both happening before someone is incarcerated, while they're incarcerated, and after they've, they've been freed. In sociology, when we study mass incarceration, we talk about it as a method of social control. So social control refers to methods, mechanisms, and practices designed to create normative compliance in individuals. So in other words, when we talk about normative compliance, what we're saying is, is that we get people to behave the way that we want them to behave. So in order to do this, um, society or the government may use coercion, force, restraint, restraints or restraining, suggestion or persuasion of one group over another in order to enforce prescribed rules of the game. And we talk about the preside, preside, prescribed rules of the game, these are like the social norms or mores. These are the expectations that we have of people, that they act a particular way, behave a certain way, that they quote unquote stay in their place. So when we talk about social control, this is not necessarily a good thing. But what this is, is that it's the reinforcement, reinforcing of ideals of one particular group that's in power. As you read through the uh, entire chapter, you should be able to sort of draw a picture about what has led to the growth of the mass incarceration system. And you should be able to highlight very particular things that have led to um, the reason why the incarceration system has grown from about 250,000 people being incarcerated um, to over to close to 3 million today over the course of the last 30 years. And so part of what I want to preside and uh, talk about in the next couple of slides is to provide you a visual of the types of things you should be able to outline in your reading notes. So when we talk about the growth of prisons and jails, there are a certain set of processes and procedures that occur before that lead to someone being incarcerated. In other words, that they're going to the jail system. Uh, starting at the very top of this visual, we have the school to prison pipeline, which we'll talk about at greater length um, in the next lecture. But essentially, uh, researchers argue that students at a very young age, and especially young African American men and Latinos, and increasingly young African American women and Latina women, are being exposed to the incarceration system at a very young age. Um, as we'll talk about in detail in the next uh, in the next lecture, this happens because schools have outsourced security to police, um, that, that there's zero tolerance policies that essentially lead to young children being, um, being sent to uh, police at a much younger age and therefore picking up a record. And we do know that as people pick up a record, it, it basically shows a pattern of behavior and leads to more people being imprisoned when they commit an infraction as they get closer to adulthood. We've also seen the change in laws and policies. So one of the things that she talks about at a more national level or at a macro level um, is the war on drugs. 
Um, and in particular with the war on drugs, this occurred at a time in which we actually did not have uh, a drug problem in the United States. That in fact, what we saw was that, um, we, that the war on drugs led to an exponential growth in the number of, uh, in particular, uh, urban African-American Latinos being, uh, being, um, being jailed and incarcerated um, at much higher rates for smaller infractions related to drugs. Under the change in laws and policies would be also very, very different sentencing um, issues uh, that happen in terms of uh, the difference between if you got caught with crack versus cocaine. Um, now, while cocaine was considered the, the rich person's drug, it was, actually, it was actually considered a misdemeanor if you had a gram or less. Uh, versus if you were picked up with a gram of crack, it was considered trafficking. So we had these disproportionate types of felonies that were being charged uh, to individuals based on, um, based on inequalities built in the law. Also under laws and, and policies, um, we also began to see, uh, um, we also began to see like the influx of different types of laws that led to uh, greater levels of incarceration. Um, so uh, some of those were attached to police practices. So under police practices, you have practices like stop and frisk, which basically, if, for example, in the state of New York, allowed police to pull someone, uh, to pull someone over or tell someone to step aside and turn out their pockets on suspicion uh, that they might be guilty. So part of what this really sort of gets at is the idea that, um, that when police were given discretion, to employ particular practices, uh, statistics showed that they disproportionately targeted African American men. And so when particular groups are targeted, they're more likely to be put in jail. The legal system itself, um, what she also highlights in her reading, uh, in the reading, is that uh, you had, for example, um, you also you have an overburden, you have an overburdened system in which public defenders Convince their uh, convince individuals who've been arrested to take plea deals, and in particular, what we saw is that particularly those with with very little money had to defend on depend on public defenders, and that whether or not they were uh, guilty or not, they were often persuaded to take plea deals, which um, which meant that they would be in jail for a, a shorter amount of time. Um, but part of what this did was that it oftentimes created a record for individuals. And we know in states like California, you have a three strikes and you're out laws. In other words, on the third strike, you're in jail for life. Uh, in addition, under the legal system, we know that there are also uh, great inequalities in terms of who serves on juries. They are disproportionately white and middle class or affluent. Um, that there also tend to be people who are um, elderly. Um, in other words, when someone is picked up for a crime from an urban inner city, they are not necessarily being judged by a jury of their peers. We also have, in terms of sentencing, a number of things going on. As I previously discussed, you had different sentencing for crack versus cocaine. Um, also, in terms of sentencing, we had things like enhancements. In other words, if someone is arrested and the prosecutor uh can argue, and the prosecutor successfully argues that you are affiliated with a gang. This can mean that you're neighbors with gang, people who are known gang members or friends with someone who's known gang member, even if you are not a gang member. You can get a gang enhancement, which basically means it would be an additional seven years on your sentence. You could also have an enhancement for trafficking. Going back to the disproportionate way in which crack and cocaine are, are prosecuted, you could have a gram of crack in your uh, pocket and it would be considered trafficking versus uh, versus a gram of co uh, of coke, and it's a, still a misdemeanor. This has very racialized implications based on who who actually participates or uses these each of the drugs. And then finally, on top of it, you have the privatization of jails. Um, particularly, you have groups like the California uh, Correctional uh, Company, which. Uh, a lot of government agencies, what they, what a lot of governments decided it was cheaper to hire uh, or outsource jails to private companies. And you can look in an area close to us like Folsom, which 30 years ago only had one jail out there, and now there's five. And that's not necessarily um, counting some of the other jails that are also in the area. Part of what happens is that governments basically sign contracts 
and uh, guaranteeing that X number of beds will be available. So these companies get paid um, based on who's incarcerated. And so as jails have become profitable, and keep in mind that some of these firms are also the same firms uh, and, organ and corporations that build detention centers for immigrants, um, the business of having more people in jail has become profitable. And so part of what Alexander argues is that these are all dynamics that feed into the growth of uh, prisons and jails before people, uh, before they're even arrested, right? So you have these series of different things. What I recommend that you do is that you take each of these sort of five areas that I've talked about here and outline very specific things within your reading journal um, that belong in each of these categories. I've just given you sort of a high level analysis and I didn't uh, necessarily go in line by line into the reading. So make sure that you take the time to understand which part of what she's talking about belong in what category. Now in this part, right, uh, this talks about what happens when someone gets out of jail. Well, part of the story of why we've seen the growth of prisons of jails is what's happening after people who were formerly incarcerated get out. And namely, what we find is that there's a high, what we call a high recidivism rate. Recidivism rate re, uh, talks about the rate at which people return to jail. So what's important to note is that there are a lot of different factors that are leading to people being returned to jail. Um, for example, we know that there's a lack of housing. And in particular, what, um, what she notes is that if you are a convicted felon, you do not have access to Section 8 housing. But what's worse is if your mom or dad, um, girlfriend or boyfriend lives in Section 8 housing and, they're, and you stay with them, um, they could lose their Section 8 housing for harboring a former criminal. So in, in essence, it becomes very hard to find permanent housing for these individuals. And for most, uh, for most who are on parole, having a concrete address is mandatory as a mandatory part of their parole. If you've been convicted of a felony, oftentimes you are disqualified from uh, many pu public safety net programs. This includes welfare, food stamps, etc. So if you're not making money, um, you, in many ways, or you're not able to get a job, in many ways you can't support yourself, right? You're often excluded from the job market because as an ex-felon, if they run a background check or they check, uh, or often even before what was happening with jobs is if you check the box that you've been convicted of a felony, most people wouldn't even look at your application. So the exclusion from the job market further compounds financial issues for someone who's formally convicted. Um, but what's worse is that there's also sets of laws that are in place that allow um, former felons to be to have uh, to have their salaries garnished. So you could be someone who successfully gets a job, but you may have to repay. In some states, you have to repay the amount of money that was spent um, on your time in jail. For some, it could be that it money money that you owed for child support while you were um, away in jail, and any number of other reasons. In some states, they can garnish your wages or garnish your salaries for up to 100%. In other words, you can be working full time and have no money to support yourself. Essentially, what Alexander argues is that the system, after you get out of jail, which labels you a criminal, discriminates against you. And very specifically, that because of the high number of Latinos and African Americans in jail, that it's actually a very specific group of people that is being discriminated against because of the label of criminal, and those are African Americans and Latinos. And so this high recidivism rate had, leads to the growth of jail, prisons and jails because these individuals, oftentimes because in order to support themselves, will, ref, will, will end up going back to illicit activities and therefore um, be arrested again and sent back to jail. So on this slide, I show just a, this is how I might I map it in class and this kind of gives you an idea of the ways in which uh, we've talked about um, things filling into the system. So I try to depict what I normally do in class on those previous two slides, but you may want to take a closer look at this particular slide um, to be able to understand how we sort of outlined what was happening uh, in terms of the reading and what she talked about in the reading. So finally, make sure that you're able to ask, answer this question of why is the mass incarceration system the new Jim Crow? And essentially, this has to do with the fact that laws, both before and after one is put in jail, disproportionately target African-American and Latinos. And so 
essentially the type of segregation that happens as a result of these laws, uh, she sees as being very parallel to the Jim Crow South and be able to talk about that explicitly.